Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the, I think this is the 31st meetup uh, of the UC Berkeley Cloud Computing Meetup. And we have a really exciting uh, topic today. And it's one of sort of our favorite kinds to have here where we show what people are actually doing with cloud computing. And this one really ties to the mission of the university uh, and to research around both uh, the coronavirus and COVID, the, um, the illness implementation of, of coronavirus. Uh, so Greg Merritt, who is uh, here at UC Berkeley at the uh, C3 AI group, will be doing the uh, intros for that. So we'll get to that in a moment, uh, but let's go to the next slide. And I wanna thank Karina Wu, uh, our CTO intern uh, for helping with the meetup and to all our planners, uh, so announcements this week, Amy, do you wanna talk about these? These are right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, definitely. So I wanna invite everybody to come to Love Data Week, which is the week of Valentine's Day. So the week of February 14th. And um, UC Berkeley is working with the other UC campuses to provide a whole lot of events and trainings all around um, data science, data management, um, all kinds of really cool events and things for the whole week. So you can come to the Berkeley events or any of the UC wide events and I will drop a link to that in the chat. And the second event I want to mention is Women in Data Science Berkeley. This is happening uh, the week of March 7th through 9th and this is part of an international event and so this is the Berkeley instance of that and um, we're going to have a couple different days of programming, um, one focused on research, one focused on what students are doing in data science and everybody's invited to attend. Um, and the idea is that it's really uplifting the voices and stories of women who are specifically uh, working in data science. So please come and I will grab the link to that as well. Excellent, thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to send a post out here and an announcement from Daniel, who was our speaker from Mithril Security last time. His video is now posted online at YouTube. We'll share a link with that. We had some Wi-Fi trouble, but he was kind enough to redo his presentation so you can watch it uh, on the web. And also they are shifting to a kind of open source model and they have a pretty interesting looking talk coming up. So you're invited to that. Um, do we have any other announcements from anybody else before we move on? Going, going, gone. Okay, next slide. And then back to Amy, our Poll Meister. <laughs> the poll guru. Um, so we just have two poll questions for you this time. So if you could please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and then you'll be prompted to enter this code 46556364. I'll give you a moment to get there. Perfect. And you'll see the code is at the top of the screen here as well. Um, so we always like to ask this question, what part of the community are you from? I see some of you are already answering, which is great. Looks like we've got some guests here today. Welcome to our guests. Skydeck is here. Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is here. Always have a lot of IT staff, which is great. Wow, lots of guests and lots of students. It's fantastic. Okay, fabulous. Welcome everybody. This is a bit of a different spread than some of our other events. So I'm delighted to have so many guests and so many students and all of you really. Uh, let's go to the next question. And we are wondering if you have used Azure before. This will be interesting for our speakers in particular. I see Greg smiling. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of funny. It's like, oh, there's so much I don't know. Oh, no, oh, no. So, oh, no, there's so much I don't know. Like, I guess I got to pick something more than somewhat. So, <laughs> so I did. Though expert seems presumptuous, but I went ahead and clicked it. <laughs> Like we have a few experts here and 
many not at all and quite a few somewhat so excellent thank you appreciate you all participating in that okay and so without further ado greg i'm going to turn it over to you uh, you know, most of you know Greg leads our Azure Community of Practice, which is sort of affiliated with this meetup group, but he's really done a tremendous amount of work in coalescing people around what's going on on campus with Azure. So I recommend you um, get in touch with him. We can post the link if you want to become more involved with that. Um, but he really did the lion's share of the work putting together uh, this meetup. And uh, so I'm super excited and I will just turn it over to you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And um, I, I do want to introduce our, our, our speakers, um, but can I lead into that, Amy? Could you advance to the, what I think is the next slide? Perfect. Thank you. So I'm on staff at UC Berkeley uh, at the, the C3.ai Digital Transformation Institute. Our site is there on the slide, c3dti.ai. And we describe ourselves as a research consortium dedicated to accelerating the benefits of artificial intelligence for business, government, and society. So I wanna kind of tell you a little bit about the Institute at the highest level, just to kind of help frame and give some context to, to the, the two presentations you'll see from Yana and Jerry. And our program is as follows. We have faculty at uh, our two kind of co-headquartered uh, institutions, Berkeley and Illinois, faculty who set the research agenda annually. They pick a broad topic, such as the pandemic, and solicit research proposals and uh, award about a couple dozen a year. And those research projects are powered, if you like, by the resources of our partners. That starts with the AI platform as a service company called C3 AI, which provides financial support to fund the research projects directly, as well as the to support for the faculty and staff of the Institute, like me. We also benefit from instances of the C3 uh, AI platform that are installed on Azure for our researchers to use. And the reason we're able to run them on Azure is because of another partner, Microsoft. Microsoft provides generous credits that allow us to run these C3 AI platform instances for the researchers as well as to provide an opportunity for research groups to use Azure services directly. And we also have partners in supercomputing facilities at Berkeley and Illinois. Now I'm on the DevOps team and our role is, is said simply is just to help the researchers use these computing resources, pick the right tool for the job and use them effectively. And the one thread of, of this, this uh, the C3.ai DTI DevOps team's work that you're going to see reflected today is the, the thread of this uh, direct Azure use by research teams. And uh, Jan and Jerry are going to present what really are two uh, distinct use cases from the research IT perspective. Uh, and uh, in one case, you'll see uh, it was primarily me and Jerry in that case, where, where Jerry did uh, really the, the heavy lifting and hard work. But I think it's safe to say we iterated. Sometimes I might prototype something and Jerry would take it and run with it. And I ended up learning a lot more cloud stuff back from Jerry. So you'll, you'll hear that story. And in Yana's case, Yana represents a, 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 a much larger team, uh, so to speak, uh, and with with folks at at least three different institutions in two different countries. And the model there, I would say, is more of a division of labor with respect to the research IT and the cloud resources. Um, so I, I was the person who set up the, the primary cloud infrastructure. Um, and so ideally, hopefully, the researchers don't have to know too much about it and can focus on the research. And we also had a partnership from someone with database experience to, to take care of the database. So maybe keep those things in mind to help frame uh, what, what, you, what you hear. Um, and with that, I think we should probably pass the screen share over to Yana, or, or unless you would like me to pull up those slides. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, I can definitely screen share. Oh, all right, let me start presenting. Okay, so, um, hi, um, can everyone see my screen? Hope, okay, see some thumbs up, thank you. Um, hello everyone, so my name is Jana, I am a fourth year computer science student here at UC Berkeley, and 
amongst other things, I have been working for a year now on this COVID research project under the supervision of the Dean Emeritus of the Public Health School, Professor Stefano Bertozzi. Now, um, our project, as Greg has mentioned, is a collaboration between UC Berkeley, UNAM, which is the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and the Mexican Institute of Social Security, or IMSS. Um, the IMSS plays a very large role in the Mexican public health system and has about 50 million beneficiaries in Mexico. Um, so the goal of our project is um, essentially to, it's very broad, it's to learn more about COVID-19 in Mexico using um, data from about 3 million people. Um, we get con constantly new updates. I think we got a recent one and it's four and a half million now, but yeah. So in some, a very, very large database. Um, we even have a database about um, patients, prescriptions and medications, which has nearly a billion records. So um, yeah, our goal is to analyze all of this information and build a machine learning model using the super learner algorithm to predict the outcome of COVID-19 disease. So that be the um, hospitalization, mortality, intubation, et cetera, um, using such health data and also to identify common factors that contribute to COVID-19 severity. Now, um, the research questions that we are working on, we pre-agree on them with the IMSS, the Mexican Institute, because it's their data that we are using. Um, and also within like achieving this larger goal, each member of our team has smaller goals or things that they're working on. So for example, the last couple of months, I have been working with the medications database to um, kind of identify which pre-COVID medications the COVID patients were taking um, with the goal of sort of having a more complete view of the health record of the patient because um, yeah, our, our data is messy, our data is perhaps incomplete, our data is difficult to work with, half of our data is in Spanish. So yeah, so it's a journey, it's a journey. Um, all right, so moving on, a little bit more about our team. So um, on the UC Berkeley side, like I mentioned, my the supervisor, the person who created this whole project is Professor Bertotti, um, who made all of this happen with the collaboration of his old friend, Professor Gutierrez at the UNAM. Um, the Mexican side, um, before I move on to the Berkeley side, the Mexican side is really, really important for us because our database with that is probably very, very large, like terabytes, gigabytes, I don't even know, um, sits in Mexico um, at the UNAM. And we have a database with from Mexico called Arturo, who with the help of Greg and Greg's colleague, ma manage the database and are the only people who can modify it or give any other user access or revoke it. So, yeah, the Mexican side is really important for that. Now on the UC Berkeley side, um, the machine learning model is the focus of um, Lauren Liao and Professor Alan Hubbard's work. They are from the biostatistics department and in particular, Professor Hubbard is the one who actually created the super learner algorithm that we are using to build our model. Um, and within this team, I lead a smaller team of four undergraduate students. So I don't only do my own analyses, I kind of supervise um, what other people are doing. Um, I have been working on this project for the longest out of all students. So I kind of know the database better and I keep track of what everyone does so that no work gets done twice. We can, which can, you know, very plausibly happen when um, you have quite a large team um, across all over the world. Someone needs to keep track of who has done what and for who. So 
Yeah, um, with that being said, um, like I've mentioned before, um, Ames is sharing a huge extent of data with us, which is a huge privilege for us because it's the first time that a Mexican institution shares this large of extent of data with um, an American institution. So um, we had to actually gain Ames trust, which was um, a process that took about eight months and their confidence in our platforms. Um, especially the fact that the health records are going to be stored securely and their access is going to be protected. Um, so in addition, another requirement for the platform is to, you know, be able to handle that huge amount of data. So we need a very large computing power that is, um, you know, way, way more than the Mac, that Mac computer that I'm currently looking at. So what is the solution to that? It's Microsoft Azure virtual machines. And now I am going to show you how it all works. So let me close the presentation. Everyone cross their fingers. Yana has agreed to do a live demo. <laughs> and right. I hear it's back up for you if need, if something. <laughs> yeah. Sure. All right, so um, every single member of our team has access to the Microsoft Azure platform. Um, it looks like this, nothing too exciting. Um, and in order to build a virtual machine now, it's not just a regular virtual machine for those who have worked with Azure before, it's um, a special virtual machine that has access to the protected data. Um, Greg has built this awesome GitHub repo, which with the click of one button can basically deploy a special context virtual machine for the user. So if I click this button right here, it's going to take me to the Microsoft Azure portal. Bear with me a couple of seconds. My internet is not the best today. Um, and now I'm going to show you how I deploy a virtual machine if it decides to load, obviously. <laughs> Yay, here it comes. Here it's coming. All right. So the first thing is to create a new resource group and name it. A resource group is just kind of the container for the virtual machine and the memory and everything. Um, let's just call it Yana Demo. Uh, oh, <laughs> we practiced. <laughs> okay. Um, the region, we're going to choose it to be South Central US because that's what our database is located and it makes more sense with the network. If you have, if you want to know about that, I'm not the right person to ask. Those questions should be addressed to Craig. Um, let's name the virtual machine, my DSVM demo, sure. Um, then right here, um, I would be choosing my admin username for the virtual machine and the password for the virtual machine, which, you know, corresponds to um, on your PC, you would have your account and the password to your account, and then maybe you have a guest account, or maybe you have an account for your partner or your child. Um, yeah, this is what the username and the passwords are for. And all right. Now oh, the, the VM size? Me. Did it want you? Oh, uh, I think the VM size was the, the last. Oh, know. sorry. Yes. No worries. Um, I choose a size for the virtual machine, which um, it's not a fixed property of the virtual machine. If I need to resize the virtual machine, I can do that um, with, again, the click of one button on the Azure portal. I just say, hi, Azure. I would like a larger virtual machine. And Azure just upgrades my virtual machine without losing any of my data saved files or anything. So that's very convenient. So yay, deployment is in progress right now. Um, it would usually take a couple of minutes for that to happen. So in order to not wait around, um, we're just gonna continue. Um, I would like to mention that another very important component of the secure access to the database is the VPN. Now you can see my VPN configured here with a special file that one can download 
only from our Azure um, portal for our group. Um, it is connected right now, which is essential because if the VPN is not connected, then um, it's simply not going to access the virtual machine. It's not going to work. So um, then I have this RDP file for my virtual machine and the Microsoft Remote Desktop app. What I would do um, when I want to start working, I would just turn my virtual machine on. Let me show you what my virtual machine looks like. Um, so Yanni, you're now jumping to the one you actually use routinely rather than the demonstration one, right? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, I have started it before this meeting started it's running right now um i would just click the rdp file enter my username password and then within a matter of a minute or two i would spawn a completely new machine inside here this is what it looks like a windows machine inside my um macbook that has access to the protected data now the data doesn't actually you know, sit within the storage of the virtual machine or anything like that. The data sits within a separate database. Um, and I can access this data through the Microsoft SQL app. Um, I would have to enter my username and a password. And then, um, yeah, this is, as you can see, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of tables um, of various sizes. And I can use the query system within Microsoft SQL to, um, you know, to just execute SQL queries and look at my data. Um, and then I, we, our team generally uses R the to, for our analyses. So um, I like to use Jupyter because um, Jupyter is a platform that have been introduced to my freshman year, so I'm very comfortable with it. Um, and yeah, for example, this is a some analyses that I've been working on analyzing pre-COVID mitigations and pre-existing conditions. Um, and before I begin, you know, sort of all of my analyses and everything, I have to authenticate from this Jupyter space with um, the remote database that sits elsewhere. This is what this connect to server piece of code does. So I have to authenticate. Um, as you can see, I have a text file sitting on my virtual machine that would contain my username and my password. And um, after I make, make the connection, I can import the data, whichever data I want to work with, um, with the connection that I have generated in the previous block of code. So, and then it will be imported just as a regular data frame and I can continue analyzing it. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much it for me. Um, does anyone have any questions or shall we move? I wonder if we should save the questions to the very end. Um, of, of both presentations, okay. I, I think um, th that was awesome. That worked really well. Uh, thanks, John. I, I, I want to um, uh, follow up with one quick one quick slide to give the just kind of a glimpse into the the cloud. Arrange my windows into the the cloud infrastructure. I want to share this desktop and move my windows around. There we go. Can you all see a diagram? Oops, I can't see you. So uh, can can you all see the diagram, I trust? So this, oh, very well, I see the head shaking now. Thank you, everyone. So this is kind of a conceptual picture of the cloud deployment. And uh, we have in the lower right, an uh, icon of a person that represents the role that, that Yana has in terms of, of researcher. And there's a, a pathway going from right to left, kind of the straight across the bottom, these sort of blue connectors. It's the pathway through the remote desktop app as Yana ran uh, through the VPN secure connection to this data science VM. Now, uh, this kind of uh, pink to, to brown uh, vertical uh, um, curved rectangle here, this represents, if you like, the subscription to which 
Jana has access when she logged into the portal and saw the virtual machines. Uh, that's uh, that that's in this scope. The database lives in a different subscription to which Jana and her research colleagues do not have access. But there's there's privilege access set up between things are isolated off the internet uh, and and so on. So this this it does a couple of things. This puts the compute close to the data, so the data. Um, doesn't have to come out. Really, what we tried to do is make it so the the easiest thing to do was was uh, access and use the data in the the right way, and and not not have anyone ever resort to oh, can I just dump all this data and put it on my machine? It's kind of too big to do that, and we really don't want that to happen. So we this is one of the designing uh, principles. I, I think I hope Yana that it's relatively simple to use. Um, and then oh, there's some yeah, other you did a great job at simplifying that. <laughs> Cool. You know, technologically challenged people <laughs> that as a computer science major <laughs> definitely fit into that category and and then some other roles and organizations are represented here that the uh, arturo who who is that the data represents the, the data owner and and the manager and the policy center so the the, the the details here are perhaps for another talk but this is just to kind of give a glimpse and and um i i um i was glad for yana to show it, it, it's a. It, I, I think in this arrangement, it's it's a it's an advantage that that um, that Yana can be relatively cloud agnostic because you know the, you can focus on the research, right? And and you can bring others on the team without having to cloud educate them. I think it's safe to say you can pretty much start pretty soon by getting them into the research. Okay, so I think um, we would be set to move to Jerry to talk about a very different project. Uh, and 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 what I see is a different relationship with, with research IT. Yeah, so let me also share the screen first. Um, can you see the slides showing yes. in its correct form? Yes, it looks good. Okay, great. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm Jerry, a fourth year graduate student from Teresa Hesboden Lab in the Department of Chemistry. So uh, today, I would just like to share my story of using Azure Cloud Computing to develop a workflow that generates drug-like molecules that can inhibit a specific protein, which might treat diseases like COVID-19. So um, this whole story that I would, like, I would like to tell is a little bit different from uh, how Yana is showing her research, but I'm will first give uh, just a general introduction of the scientific background and also then uh, just say how some Azure infrastructure will provide us with some advantages of doing this whole uh, project. So here is just the content today and I will just first uh, give some uh, scientific background and the motivation for the project and then I will mainly discuss how we use cloud compute uh, uh, how we use cloud computing to tackle the key difficulties in the project and ultimately build the whole solution on Azure Cloud. And meanwhile, I will share some practices that we took in the process to keep the cost as low as possible. So in this project, we use SARS-CoV-2 as an example, but what we really want to build is a generalizable workflow for generating inhibitors for a lot of different diseases-related proteins. Here, I just summarize a traditional workflow of how drug molecules are developed in early stages. We usually start by defining a database, and um, these databases uh, they contain a lot of mole molecules which cover the diversity of the molecular space. And in the next step, we use some very crude methods like the rigid body docking uh, to evaluate the potency of these molecules' interactions with a target protein. These simulations can run very fast, but they are not very accurate. And for those selected molecules, uh, they were treated with the docking with higher accuracy, like using AutoDock or Glide to validate their quality. And finally, these candidates will be sent for synthesis and experimental validation. The whole workflow is uh, just very time consuming and they, are, they have very high risk because it is mainly just directed by trial and error. So this leads us to wonder whether there is a different approach to generate those molecules that, are, that is more efficient, like using machine learning to learn the key components that can make a molecule a good binder to a specific protein. 
And following this idea, we started to develop our machine learning workflow for generating the molecules specifically inhibit the protein. Just to start developing a molecule, molecule generator using a neural network, let's see how we can represent the molecule in the computer. We took the string representation, which enables us to try a large variety of language models as our generative model. Specifically, we use a selfish representation. And uh, due to, and the reason why I use that is because it has a very high robustness in representing chemically valid molecules. A selfish string is composed from all of the tokens that I listed in this table. And as an example, here is, uh, here is the selfish string for the caffeine molecule that I show the structure right here. For your convenience, I have matched the components in the structure um, with the tokens in the selfish strings using the same color. So you can see how this string is translated into the molecule. Another problem we need to solve is evaluating how good a molecule can be a binder for the protein. In this scenario, we call the protein a target and uh, the molecule that binds to the protein the ligand. An inhibitor for the protein has some delicate functional groups and the molecular shapes to match the protein so that it combines tightly with the protein and make it dysfunctional. We can calculate the energy that is released when the target and the ligand is combined into a complex. If more energy is released, then that means the interaction between the target and the ligand is stronger. And we define this interaction energy as our docking score. In practice, we first translate the selfie strings into uh, a molecule of the 2D structure. And then the docking software will generate uh, some 3D structures of that molecule, which we call as the conformations. Uh, in the next step, uh, we combine these conformations with the 3D structure of the protein, and we calculate the interaction energies for each conformation with the protein using a force field. And in the end, the lowest energy is returned as our docking score, and also together with the details of that conformation. So now let me show you how we can build our complete, wor uh, complete workflow. We use a reinforcement learning algorithm uh, and with a generated model to generate strings that can be translated into molecules. And we also have an evaluation model that can give the scores to those generated molecules. In the generated model, the tokens are generated one by one. And we use an AWD LSTM, which is a specific type of recurrent neural network to predict the probability of the various tokens uh, following a sequence that represents part of a selfish string. We will then sample from uh, this distribution and add the next token back to the string. And then we use this new string to pred predict the probability of the next token. We just continue this process uh, until we uh, have a complete string that represents uh, a molecule. In, the, uh, in each reinforcement learning training loop, we will generate 2,000 molecules and send them to the evaluation model to run the docking simulations in parallel. The docking scores are circled back to the machine learning model to adjust its parameters so that the molecules generated in the next iteration will have better docking scores. In realizing this training workflow, the two components of the model training and the molecular docking have different technical requirements. So they probably need to run on different hardware. But the two parts also need to communicate with the, each other in an automatic way. On the generated model training side, we have a Python code that trains the machine learning model. And uh, it requires powerful GPU to train. Um, in each iteration, we will generate 2,000 molecules. Each can be represented as a string that is less than 1 KB. And we need to run approximately 400 iterations for the convergence. And on the docking side, we have pre-compiled binaries and bash scripts to run the docking simulations. The scoring for, uh, the, the scoring for each molecule takes several minutes. 
um, but running the code with multiple molecules can be easily parallelizable. Finally, it needs to return the docking scores and the associated confirmations um, for each molecule, which is approximately two to five KB for each molecule. Overall, it is a technically challenging application to build. After we searched through the catalog of services provided by Microsoft Azure, we found some op options that perfectly fit our needs. So in the next part, I will discuss specifically how we use Azure Machine Learning, uh, Azure Function, and Azure Batch, these services, to realize our construction of the workflow. The GPU training part is actually the main framework of the code, which runs on its own, but it needs to communicate with an external service to, uh, to run the docking. In principle, we can run the GPU code anywhere that has a decent GPU, but we found Azure Machine Learning to be an excellent option. It provides a lot of benefits at different stages of the computation. For the dataset preparation, um, it has a very nice version control for the datasets. And it's easy to see what models and sets of experiments have used that version of the data set. So a lot of errors that might be caused by two different, diff uh, two different versions of the data set could be prevented. During the model building, Azure Machine Learning has great support for PyTorch code that we are using. And our modifications on the code to make it run on Azure is minimal. It also provides a wide variety of GPU computing targets that we can choose from. And there are also options for compute clusters that can dynamically adjust the number of computing nodes. Finally, the Azure Machine Learning Portal provides a powerful logging and metric visualization function. For each experiment that we perform, it keeps track of all the hyperparameters, and it is just super easy to make comparisons between runs. So here I just give an example of how it looks like for the Azure Machine Learning Portal. So we, we can see that we have all of our runs listed right here. And we can also see uh, how long these jobs have been running. They have logged the latest matrix. And also we can plot, uh, we can have these plots that help us understand the training of the model better. All of these tools made our training better tracked and easier to understand. Running the parallel docking on CPU is actually more challenging. Since our major requirement is to run docking in parallel as much as possible, we tried Azure Function as our first option. Azure Function is a serverless architecture, which can be understood as a remote function that can be triggered to execute under some specific conditions, like through the REST API. It is especially suited for our case because our inputs and outputs are all small size data. Azure Function apps can automatically scale up to 400 instances running at once. And when it is not running, it can scale down to save money. We also found that Azure Function supports custom container images. So we built a Docker image to run the doc docking software and use that to create our computing instances. Uh, on the bottom, I just display the logic of the Azure function. We will trigger the Azure function execution by HTTP request with the molecular string as the additional parameters. Azure function will then run the docking code. And once it fin finishes, it sends back an HTTP response with the docking score and the confirmation. Now, if we send multiple HTTP requests at the same time, the docking will be done in parallel. So we also wrote a dispatcher script to send multiple HTTP requests with different molecules. And we also have a collector script to collect all the data from the finished calculation and send the docking scores back for the training of the machine learning model. We found this solution basically works, but there are some key issues with it. First of all, uh, every time when we scale up, there is a warm up time uh, before it can actually start running the docking simulations, which may take up to one minute. And we don't want to waste so much time 
waiting for the warm up in every iteration. But there's a more important issue. Every call on the Azure function has a maximum waiting time for the response, which is 240 seconds. But many calculations actually cannot finish within this time, especially when the warm up time also applies. When a new HTTP request is sent to a computing instance that has not yet finished the previous calculation, it will get stuck. So eventually, all the computing instances will get stuck, and we cannot run any new calculations. We are also not satisfied with the compute, uh, configuration that we could choose from, because they're not great for running CPU intense jobs like molecular docking. So we have to look into other solutions. And we ultimately settled down on the Azure Bash service. It is designed specifically for running Bash jobs that can be computationally heavy. And compared to the Azure Function solution, it has a lot of advantages. First, it provides a broader options. Uh, it provides a broader option of compute instances and we can choose those CPUs that are specifically designed for high performance computation. It also has better batch job and resource management, and we can control which job to run, which job to stop through Python API in our own code. There's no time limit on the task running, and each job can run until it finishes, but we could also kill it in the middle if we want to. Finally, uh, it provides options to scale up to even bigger pools of computation instances than Azure Function can achieve. But there, uh, it also has a challenge, which is uh, by using Azure Bash, it is more complicated to run our custom docking software on Azure Bash, but we still find a solution to do that. So what we have done is to use custom image definitions as a template when we create a computation pool. And these custom images can be a snapshot of a virtual machine. And that's how we did it. On the right, I'm showing the organization of the Azure Bash service. So this application or service corresponds to our master code, which uploads the molecules generated by the machine learning model to the Azure storage. It also sets up the jobs that run the multiple tasks. Each task will correspond to a single docking uh, calculation, which runs on a dedicated node in the compute pool. Once the job finishes, the results are saved back to the Azure storage, and the code will finally download all the results uh, in the end. With the Azure Batch, we finally found a way to do massive parallel CPU computations. And all the communication code with Azure Batch service was included in the GPU training code. So we closed the loop for the GPU and CPU heterogeneous training. We used 200 nodes in the pool, and we were able to finish the docking calculations for 2,000 molecules in each iteration within about 40 minutes. If we uh, if without this Azure Bash service and we just rely on the CPU from a GPU node, running the same amount of docking simulations for the molecules in an iteration could take up to five days. So this Azure Bash service is definitely making something impossible into possible. We train our model for a total of 400 iterations, which takes approximately two weeks. And we found the docking score improved throughout the whole training process. Here are just some examples of the molecules generated at the end of our training. And in this figure on the right, uh, we show the docked conformations of the generated molecules onto the pocket of the target protein. And we found that uh, we have a very good match between the shapes of the generated molecules with the shape of the protein pocket. Also, we have found different types of favorable non-bounded interactions between the generated molecules and the residues around the binding pocket in the protein, further supporting that our generated molecules are good binders according to computer simulations. As the last part of my talk, I would like to introduce some of the practice that we found useful for saving resources and money in the cloud development. 
you see an important property of our application is the combination of the CPU and GPU utilization, but they are not executed at the same time. Instead, the requests for the CPUs and GPUs actually occur alternatively. Specifically, when the GPU is generating molecules and training the model, the CPU is waiting. And when the CPU is running the docking simulations, the GPU is waiting. Since the CPU computations are heavier and burns more money, we try to make the GPU code run continuously, but let the CPU jobs scale up and down depending on the workload. Azure Batch's elastic pool gave us an option to do this, and we can write custom code to control the scaling behavior. As a result, we managed to avoid as much CPU idling as possible. Meanwhile, by using the massive parallelization and high performance CPUs to do the docking, we also significantly decrease the overall wait time between the iteration, iterations on the GPU side, which is also a strategy for saving both the time and money. Finally, we wrote some custom code to better manage the CPU tasks and kill those jobs that are taking too long or some of the latest jobs that decrease the overall parallelization efficiency of our code. So that's basically all I want to share today. To summarize, we have designed a reinforcement learning and generative model workflow to generate some small molecules that can inhibit our target protein. And we use uh, SARS-CoV-2 related proteins as our example. Uh, in the building of this whole workflow, we use a lot of different Azure services like Azure Machine Learning and Azure Batch. And these are the key cloud infrastructure that makes the whole workflow possible. And finally, we use this workflow to generate some molecules that are predicted to have strong interactions with the protein. And we have now sent these molecules to our experimental collaboration groups and they will do experiments to validate whether these molecules are indeed uh, good molecules to be developed into drugs. So that is the end of the talk. Um, this whole project is led by my PI, Pro Professor Teresa Hadgotten, and also uh, another PI, Rami Amaro from UC San Diego. And I would like to thank uh, a lot of group members from these two groups, uh, including OFAN, Dr. Moshtaba, uh, Nancy, Dr. Itai from our group, and Dr. Fiona and Dr. Connor from uh, Rami's group. I, will, I would also like to thank Greg, Matt, Ian, and Mike for a lot of support they provided for the C3 AI and also uh, setting up the cloud infrastructure. And this whole project is funded by the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute and NIH. And uh, we have used Microsoft Azure and NERSC um, as our computational resources. Oh, finally, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. If I could just insert myself briefly, thank you to both uh, Jerry and Yana. And, and I, uh, I have to say that, Jerry, when you say we, you know, with the Azure stuff, it's 98% you. So <laughs> recognize that. And, um, and, and also, I, I just have to say, I mean, um, I think it's, it's, for me, there's special value in this work because I mean, Yana and the Bratazzi team are trying to understand how and why we get sick. And Jerry and the Head Gordon team are trying to make us better when we do. And it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, kind of heavy, but thank you. That was fantastic. So the floor is open for questions for um, both of our presenters. Oh, actually all three. I just had one question. Uh, in Jerry, in your presentation, you mentioned the difference between Azure ML and then Azure Batch. How do you go about testing those differences and determining which service you want to keep using for the project? Well, um, the reason why we use Azure Machine Learning is because uh, for the GPU training part, we need a GPU, we need a resource from Azure that can run these GPU calculations. So uh, for that, actually, I just um, find like the keyword of GPU from the catalog of Azure services and just to see like 
uh, what kind of service that we can use to run the GPU training. And um, so that is how we uh, settled down on using Azure Machine Learning to do the GPU training part. And for the Azure Batch, actually, that was, uh, as I have mentioned in, the, in my talk, that was not my first choice. And we actually had some, um, we have tried some other options and um, we just keep trying and see which, uh, which one fits our need best. And in the end, we found that this Azure Batch service is just uh, a better option for running these docking simulations in parallel. And that's how we settled down on using Azure Batch to do the CPU parallelization. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have some questions coming in the chat. Uh, so the first one is, uh, did you set up the Azure CI CD pipeline for deployment of the model? Um, no, actually we just use the, uh, we just use Azure Machine Learning to train the model, but the, deploy, the deployment is not something that we look into because uh, after we have trained the model, we just download these molecules to, uh, to our own computers and do the uh, continued analysis of these molecules. Great, thank you. And uh, we have, will cloud software continue to develop in favor of cloud agnostic users slash researchers? How should less experienced researchers approach learning and making use of cloud platforms like Microsoft Azure? So I, that's maybe Greg for you or Yana. I don't know whether they're asking like what you do on the magic making side of it or actually for either one of the other speakers. And you know, I was writing a question of my own and, and missed that. Um, could you simply repeat? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, is this Lucas's question? Yes, Lucas's question. Thank you. Well, cloud software. Um, um, boy, how to predict cloud software? Um, so, or, or Yana, do, if you had thoughts on that, feel free to jump in first. But I could also. Um. So I think the coolest thing about the deployment of the cloud software that Greg created for us is that, um, like you said, cloud agnostic users and researchers can use it. And for example, um, a lot of the more senior researchers on our team, um, they are trained in biostatistics. So um, they know how to do the biostatistics algorithms with, I don't know, Studio or Jupyter or whatever, and they do a great job at that. But um, you can't really do, um, again, this kind of research that we are doing on your own personal computer. You need solutions for that. And um, as the problems that we, and by mean we as like a you know wider society, the problems that we are trying to tackle are getting more complicated. Um, it seems to me that um, cloud agnostic users and researchers um, should be able to use cloud software um, without having to, you know, worry about all the little details. And I think if cloud, if cloud software did develop in, um, in favor of those kind of people, then um, we could do so much better in terms of the output of our research. And and I, I might add sort of, an, an, a, sort of an another dimension uh, that uh, we hear more and more about the notion of multi-cloud. I mean, so from the, a cloud strategy perspective, you know, uh, as as folks are thinking about cloud deployments, thinking about how it can whether mix or switch between providers, and 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 then uh, as far as the the less experienced researchers. Well, I mean, I think we we have a, a couple of, of different uh, models. Oh, that is, uh, researchers less experienced in cloud. I think you either kind of uh, two models in 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 this uh, present these presentations. You know, uh, Jerry, you know, cut his teeth and dove in and, and learned about it, um, and climbed that learning curve, and and you know, I tried to help uh, where I could, but he was he invested his time, and uh, with the Rotazzi group, there is a partnership, right? So, um, a, a division of labor, I think. So. There, there are different ways. Great, thank you, Greg. Uh, let's see, so uh, Lexi has a question. Uh, question for Jerry, how does Azure ML and Azure Batch talk to each other? Yeah, so um, 
the answer to that is actually uh, mainly relying on the uh, the Python APIs that is uh, from the Azure Bash service because our master code is running uh, for the GPU docking and uh, that resides in the Azure machine learning. And the talking of the, these two modules is actually just um, the machine learning code needs to uh, initiate the calculations on the CPU side and collect the results back to itself. So uh, as long as we have these um, Azure APIs that can initiate those parallel calculations and also collect the results, then we realize this talking to each other of the two services. And um, uh, it is very nice that all of these Python APIs are, are um, that we can directly use for the Azure batch. And that is how we establish this uh, connection between the two modules. Thank you. Uh, uh, Zhen Zhao wrote, Jerry shared the use of Azure in biostatistics. So are there examples of parallel computing in Azure in other areas like computer vision and recommendation systems? Maybe for you, Greg. So um, the, uh, the short answer is, is, is yes. Um, but the, 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 my first sort of experience with the, the, the the, the more parallel kind of work in, in this sort of category is is through Jerry's project. I um I, I only started cutting my teeth on on Azure maybe about a year and a half ago, so um, I'm, I still still keep learning as I'm going. And I got a question from Roland. Uh, thank you, Yana and Jerry, for your excellent presentations. A question for you both: uh, Was the MISS dataset covered by an equivalent of the U.S. HIPAA security and privacy rule? Uh, or was it completely de-identified? How did you decide between using a VPN versus a service like Azure Bastion? Um, would so you like me or would you like? I think maybe start with her on the HIPAA and then go to you for the Bastion question. I'm guessing, I don't know. You guys can pack it up. <laughs> um, I, I definitely don't really know how to answer the latter part of the question, but I can definitely answer the first half of it. Um, so I, so the data set is completely de-identified in the way that we don't know. The only kind of like more personal information about the patient that we know is their um, social security number. And then um, they have also an addition to the social security number, which distinguishes the beneficiary within the family of beneficiaries, whatever. Um, so that's kind of the only personal information that we have of, of, of the patient. We don't know their home address, um, where they live, so which creates another challenge, a little bit of a challenge for our project as, because um, Mexico is such a large country with very different regions. Um, how do we, how do we know where a patient is from, right? Um, so, I mean, th there, are work, there are ways we're working around this, but yeah. Um, and the issue with obtaining the data. So I am not sure whether there's um, an, I honestly don't really know what the HIPAA security privacy rule is. Um, there probably is something equivalent, but I guess it's not as much of a big deal as the US um, rule. Um, but really the issue with our project was, um, a so essentially, um, the some leadership team within the AIMS who deals with um, research projects like ours approve the research project and the transfer of data and then the leadership within the AIMS changed and the new leadership wasn't so keen on um, actually sharing the data when the time came to actually share the data. Um, again, it's not something that I have directly encountered. It's not not something that I've been dealing with. It was up to my supervisor, Professor Bertotti, to kind of um, lay those things straight. But yeah, it was more of an internal kind of problem rather than legal problem. Yeah. And I would say that that um, uh, the 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 uh, IMS is the original source of the data and has had I think a longer standing relationship with UNAM, right? Mm -hmm. And and so the the database person from UNAM. Uh, then uh, basically you, uh, I worked with him for replicating a similar kind of environment, but in the cloud rather than on-prem. So in a sense, kind of, he was able to re-implement that kind of context that, that satisfied the requirements uh, on the on-prem, you know, but then moved to cloud. 
Great. I, th I lost my place in the sea of questions uh -huh. um, from Saba. And we'll just keep going with the questions. We're past time. I know if some people have to drop off, but we will try to get to all the questions that are there. And, uh, and Yana so and Jerry, do you have a couple of minutes? Yeah, just as long as you guys have time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this one's for Yana. From your research, what interesting information or trend, if any, have you seen with the COVID-19 data from IMSS? Um, so one interesting, very peculiar thing that we're seeing that we're kind of trying to solve this problem, or maybe it's not even a problem, but um, as perhaps most of you would know, um, common literature says that the factors that contribute to a person um, getting you know, severely ill from COVID-19 are pre-existing conditions such as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and also the age the age of the patient is very important. But what our machine learning model says is that only the age is really like a strong predictor and everything else is meh, which kind of seems not very intuitive that a 65, say a 65 year old man with diabetes is as likely to get hospitalized from COVID as a 65 year old man without diabetes who leads a healthy lifestyle. But again, that might be a problem with the data. Um, as I have mentioned, I'm working with the medications data to um, kind of try to identify the missing bits and bobs in the patient's health record. And one thing that I saw is that um, metformin is a very com is a drug that is very commonly prescribed for diabetes. Um, a third of the prescriptions of metformin are well dispensed to patients that are not indicated to have diabetes in the main database, um, which yes, metformin might be dispensed as a pre-diabetes drug, but you know, that, that is also quite odd. So um, yeah, hopefully with the data that I gather from the medication table, we'll have a more complete view of the factors that contribute to a person getting COVID-19, or maybe we won't. And that's also a great result that should be published out there. Thank you. There's a lot of kudos in here to all the presenters, so I'm, I'm flipping through those. Um, does Azure Batch auto scale pools on demand, or does it have to be enabled explicitly? Actually, when you create a pool from Azure Batch, you can choose either it is a fixed size uh, pool, or you can let it to scale up and down according to some kind of either predefined rules, or it also provides you with an option to write the logic for scaling up and down depending on the workload. So if you want to do that, then there is a set of uh, like uh, language that you can use specifically for controlling this scaling behavior. And you have access to uh, some kind of workload related variables that you can use in your logic to decide how you should scale up and down of your pool. So you have a lot of freedom in choosing how you do that. Thank you. And we're gonna end with Derek's question, which I'll get to in a second, but we have Akansha. Did you use the Azure dashboard features to analyze data? If, um, if this Azure dashboard is referred to a dedicated service in Azure, then I think the answer is no, but um, like the dashboard that is provided through the Azure machine learning portal is something that I found very useful to keep track of my experiments and make comparisons. Thank you. Uh, so two more questions from Justin. Uh, Jerry, good job. Is there an estimate on how much costs were put down by using Azure for large scale parallelized CPU computation? Um, it's a little bit hard to estimate on the cost that is cut down, but what I can say is that um, if it is not at the, this Azure Batch service, then we just do not have so much time to run a lot of calculations and do this uh, whole reinforcement learning workflow. So it's more of um, the difference between you can do that or you cannot do that rather than how much money you can save from, uh, from using Azure Batch. And and I, I just for orders of magnitude, bo both of these projects, uh, uh, it's kind of out of context, but the, the, the spend, you know, probably in the, the high tens to, to, to low $100,000 um, kind of scope. And then this is a question I think for anyone, uh, are cloud providers making any public medical data sets available for researchers outside of the groups involved with this uh, research being described today? 
So I, I think I, I, this is not my field, but I happen to go to some some Azure office hours, research for education uh, office hours. Uh, um, uh, and and th there is discussion there about which cloud providers have which data sets and and different ways. If you're working in one cloud provider, to you know cache or 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 mirror or or tap into. Uh, so I think the short answer is is that cloud providers are providing data sets, but I think it's kind of you have to go, go looking and yeah. All right, thank you, Greg. Now thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Yana and Jerry. That was fabulous. Thank you, Greg, for helping us put that together. Next month, February 24th, we're going to completely shift gears and we will be having a vendor showcase featured on Google. So we are <laughs> truly multi-cloud in the meetup and um, we're working with Google to put together a research example that will showcase uh, how people are using GCP. So look forward to seeing you all then February 24th at the usual uh, one o'clock time frame, and we'll send out more information to you. Thanks everybody for coming and see you next month.